So now as we hop right back into it, we've established the idea that Archibald Gerald stated that Mendel's laws do apply to humans because genotype dictates phenotype. The process by which DNA, the genotype, directs the synthesis of a phenotype, like a protein being made, like an enzyme being made, is the whole idea behind gene expression. And Archibald Durad was able to show this in humans by studying inherited diseases, thus studying diseases that are dictated by a genotype, thus studying diseases that will eventually result in a faulty phenotype like a lack of enzymatic function. And let's remember, whenever you see enzyme, you have to automatically understand that an enzyme is also a protein. Thus, it follows this statement, the process by which DNA directs the synthesis of proteins. So if you have a bad DNA mutation or a lack of function in the DNA, that will result in a lack of function in the protein. In other words, lack of genotype or a problem with genotype creates a problem with phenotype. That's the whole concept behind gene expression pro proven by Archibald Jerome. The next couple of guys that we need to understand are two men by the name of Beetle and Tatum. So Beetle and Tatum. And they did their work in the 1920s. So we're going to write down the 1920s in parentheses just to have an idea of how far back they were able to establish this. So what the Beetle and Tatum did, uh, they actually studied a very interesting organism. They studied something called Neurospora, so Neurospora crassa, C-A-R-S-S-A. -S 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 -A. This is otherwise simply known to us as bread mold. So. I think this is incredible to think that something as simple as bread mold studied by Beetle and Tatum is going to end up giving us an incredible amount of information in regards to gene expression. Let me prove that to you. So this is their basic observation, Beetle and Tatum. They were in their lab and they observed the following. So this is their basic observation. The wild type, and let's remember, the wild type of bread mold would be the bread mold that shows up the most often in the environment, let's say. The wild type can live on what we refer to as minimal media. So I'll write M-I-N media. What does that mean? What is minimal media in the sort of essence of science? So minimal media is a very simple idea. And this whole statement of wild type can live on minimal media, and when we refer to wild type, we're referring to the bread mold wild type specifically, states the following. The mold, the bread mold that is, will grow, will absolutely grow on what we can refer to as the bare minimum of nutrients. That's why we call it the minimal media. Media is just a place that we are going to put um, bread mold on. And that media is going to be minimum or minimal because of the fact that it has the bare minimum. Mold will grow on bare minimum, let's say, nutrients. So I'll just write N-U-T-R for nutrients. And now we can ask ourselves, how? How does it possibly grow on just the bare minimum? And this is because of the following statement. And this is important. It's the key idea here. So I'm going to just extend that over here. Mold with what we call inborn, so there's that word again, mold with inborn pathways to make other nutrients. So what does that mean? What we're basically stating here is that even though the media, the place that this mold is growing, has only the bare minimum of nutrients, there is something that dictates this mold to have the inborn pathways, this inborn idea, to make everything else it needs to live, can live on minimal media. So now we have to explore this a little bit further. Let's manipulate this idea that we know that bread mold can live on minimal media, and let's experiment with this idea. Let's experiment with this inborn pathway. Let's see if we can manipulate it to try to prove that this inborn pathway is because of DNA. 
It's because of a genotype that's dictating a phenotype like making nutrients. So let's see their experiment. So observation, now it's time for an experiment. Beetle and Tatum, basically, very simply speaking, they actually bombarded, that's the exact words, they bombarded mold with x-rays. And if you know anything about x-rays, if you are bombarded by them, if you are constantly exposed to x-rays, this will induce and create many mutations. So this creates mutations. So they purposefully created mutations in what do you think? Where are these mutations happening? If we're talking about gene expression, it's of course happening in the gene, in the DNA. And they're going to see if you mutate the DNA, does this affect the synthesis of proteins? Does this affect a phenotype? So let's see. We've created mutations. You know what they noticed? They actually really figured out that there were indeed genotypic changes. But that's not a big deal. We know that. We know that there are going to be DNA changes. Oops, genotypic, let's say changes, not mutations. Genotypic changes. We know that. We know that x-rays are going to change your genes. That's something that's obvious. But what we have to ask ourselves is, did they observe phenotypic changes? Because look, what we have to understand is the same thing as Jerome did. Did we see phenotypic changes? Over here, what he saw was that genotype does indeed dictate phenotype. That when we have a lack of enzymatic function, that means we have a problem with the genotype. That means we have a problem with the DNA that's directing the synthesis of an enzyme's function. That's directing the synthesis of proteins. Is the same seen in something as simple as bread mold? And yes, it is indeed seen. We can finally end this idea of beetle and tatum by stating the following. The mutant bread mold, the bread mold that has been exposed to x-rays, the mutant bread mold, okay, mutant bread mold can't, it actually can't make all, uh, let's say, essential enzymes. Because look, how did wild type bread mold, normal bread mold, live on minimal, me minimal media? Well, it lived because it had inborn pathways, basically genotypic pathways, DNA pathways, to make everything else necessary to live with the bare minimum. But what happens if you mutate this bread mold and then put it on bare minimum, on put it on minimal media, does it still have the ability to make everything necessary if there's only a minimal amount of things on the media? No. The mutant bread mold can't make all essential enzymes on, let's say, minimal media. That is incredible. That is a huge discovery. What we understand is that these are now called nutritional mutants. They cannot function in terms of their nutrition because they have a problem with directing the synthesis of metabolic proteins necessary to live on bare minimal media and thus we can firmly state that genotype in this bread mold situation even in that situation genotype dictates phenotype that is critical, that is huge, and that certainly proves that gene expression is indeed the process by which DNA directs the synthesis of proteins. Our genotype directs our phenotype. That is gene expression in a nutshell. And overall, we end up with one final conclusion, and that final conclusion, based off of Archibald Giraud and Beetle and Tatum and their complex yet simple experiments, states the following. There's the idea of one gene, let me rewrite that, one gene, one protein hypothesis. One protein, we can even call it a one polypeptide if you want. That's, the, I think, the actual term, but protein is simple as well. It's called the one gene, one protein hypothesis. That's the overall arching sort of end result of Beetle and Tatum and Archibald Giraud, which states the following. This states that... Genes provide instructions. Genes provide instructions. And I think that's a great word here. Instructions for producing specific proteins. For producing specific proteins.
proteins. And I know we're getting a little jumbled up here, but we're done now. So, one gene, one protein hypothesis basically states that when you have a gene, that gene will provide the necessary direction of synthesis, the instructions necessary to make specific proteins like enzymes, like nutritional pathways that are necessary to live on minimal media. Overall, basically what we're stating here through this history analysis is that there is indeed a directing mechanism that the DNA, that the genotype holds over the phenotype, and now it's time to study that mechanism. How can we show, molecularly speaking, that DNA is going to eventually turn into protein? How does this process happen? And that's what the rest of gene expression is all about.